Hi, my name is Dr. Leela Landowski, and today we're going to be talking about sleep, which just so happens to be one of my favorite topics, and not just because I don't get much of it. So sleep is one of the three pillars of health. So it's one of the things that we need to live well in our lives. The other two things being physical activity and eating well. Now, we used to think that sleep was a bit of a waste of time. You know, why are we lying there for a third of our lives in this state of suspended animation? Why is this important? Well, there was an experiment done on 1.6 billion people that gives us a pretty good indication why it's important. It's called daylight savings. So we know that losing one hour of sleep results in a 24% increase in heart attacks the following day. There's also more suicidality. There's also more mental health um, issues. There's more car accidents. So you can already see that sleep and not getting enough of it has quite profound effects on the body. But it's not just that. So for example, we know that when you're sleeping, all of your key memories, those key short-term memories that you've developed or learned throughout the course of the day get turned into long-term memories. We also know that throughout the course of your day, your brain creates metabolic waste. That only gets removed at night time when you're sleeping. Um, we also know that it is important for emotional regulation. So the part of your brain called your amygdala, the emotion part of your brain is about 60% more reactive when we haven't slept, which goes some way to explain why you're so emotionally labile when you haven't slept enough. It's also really important for resetting your metabolism. So for example, we know that people who haven't slept enough your body basically turns into a pre-diabetic state just from one night of um, impaired sleep. It's also really important for our immune systems. So, for example, we know that you make more antibodies to the flu va vaccine if you've slept well a couple of days before having that vaccine compared to not. So clearly, sleep is important. So let's take a bit of a deep dive into what is actually happening in the brain to drive this sleep process. So I think I might start with the whole concept of memory consolidation. So I mentioned that when we're sleeping, short-term memories turn into long-term memories. Well, during the course of the day, our hippocampus, which you can see here in the diagram in red, is it's a bit like a diary. It's keeping track of what you're doing from minute to minute. It's storing these short-term memories that kind of pinpoint what we've been doing throughout the course of the day. So if I'm thinking about what I did before recording this lecture, that's my hippocampus recalling that information. But it doesn't hold that information in our brain for very long, you know, about a day. When we're sleeping, all that short-term information from our hippocampus gets flitted out to different parts of our, our cortex, our cerebral cortex, turning that into long-term memory. If you don't sleep, that process of um, memory consolidation doesn't occur. So you literally forget everything that you may have learned during the course of the day. So, you know, if you don't sleep, those short-term memories become eroded away. So if you're studying for an exam, the best thing that you can possibly do is prioritise your sleep because that is how you're going to ultimately remember these things that you've been trying to learn throughout the course of the day. I mean, if you think about any time that you've crammed for an exam, you pulled an all-nighter trying to study for an exam, maybe you did okay in the exam, but can you actually remember anything that you studied? Probably not, because if you haven't slept, that information didn't have a chance to get consolidated into those long-term memories. So sleeping is incredibly important for your study as a future healthcare professional, so definitely get on to that. So there are two main mechanisms driving sleep. So there's the homeostatic mechanism and there's the circadian, um, circadian rhythm, otherwise known as the body clock. Most of us are pretty familiar with the body clock, so I might start with talking about that. So circadian rhythm is mostly controlled by our body's exposure to light. So we know that um, neurons in our eye, when the levels of light in our environment decrease, the neurons in our eye send a signal to a certain part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which we can see over here. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus then sends its signal to two other parts of the body, or two other parts of the brain. Number one, the pineal gland, which produces the sleep hormone called 
uh, melatonin, which many of you might be familiar with. So decreased levels of light means we get increased levels of melatonin, this sleep-inducing hormone. The other thing that it signals to um, is the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus, which then sends a signal to the reticular formation, making that reticular, or it's reticular formation or the reticular activating system. There are two different ways of, of um, nomenclature for this particular part of the brain. So normally the reticular activating system stimulates the part of the brain called the thalamus. Now the thalamus is basically, you know, getting information about our outside world. It's taking that information about our outside world and sending it out through to the cerebral cortex. So that way our cerebral cortex can make really good informed decisions about how to respond to any situation because it knows what's going on in our surrounding world. Now, when we are falling or when we're falling asleep, what's actually happening is this reticular activating system or the reticular formation um, decreases its stimulation of the thalamus. So this, the thalamus becomes less active and that also starts to disconnect from this cerebral cortex. So your cerebral cortex isn't getting that information about the outside world. And ultimately this and the melatonin from your pineal gland helps drive this um, process of falling asleep. So we get decreased consciousness and falling asleep. So this is one of those two processes. So we've got the circadian rhythm, which is driving, I guess, our sense of wakefulness. And we've also got um, homeostatic regulation of sleep. But one moment, I'd just like to take a moment to talk about another part of our um, circadian rhythm, which um, is called cortisol. So we know that the hormone cortisol also actually interacts with our, um, our body clock. And the way it does that is it kind of works in the opposite way that melatonin does. So when we wake up in the morning, our cortisol levels in our blood are very high, as you can see here in this graph. So upon waking, we'll have out the highest levels of cortisol in our bloodstream. And over the course of the day, that will decrease. And it will be lowest at night time when we are falling asleep. So it'll be the opposite of the melatonin which remember the melatonin increases in response to low levels of light. So this low level of cortisol works in concert with the high level of melatonin in helping us get to sleep. Over the course of the, the evening, the cortisol levels will eventually rise and they'll peak when we wake up in the morning. Now, as you may recall, cortisol is a stress hormone. So if you've had a really stressful day and you've had a lot of things that have been stimulating you, um, your cortisol levels might actually be quite high at night time, which is why if you're really stressed in your life, you might have difficulty sleeping. So high levels of cortisol is gonna make it harder for you to get to sleep. And it's also going to decrease the quality of your sleep because you're going to wake up more often. So this is also how um, cortisol can influence that circadian rhythm. Now I was about to talk about the homeostatic sleep mechanisms. So here we are. Homeostatic regulation of sleep is also one of the key drivers of us falling asleep. So during the course of the day, the neurons in our brain, not only the neurons, but the glia in our brain as well, they're all taking um, energy in the form of ATP and it's breaking it down into AMP and adenosine. So ATP is being broken down into AMP and adenosine to allow us to function, right? Now the thing is, adenosine is actually what we call a sleep inducing molecule. So over the course of the day, we're making more of this adenosine and we're also getting progressively more tired. So the more that we're using our brain, the more adenosine we are producing and the more tired we get over the course of the day. So what happens is adenosine um, gets uh, released into the surround, the, the tissue parenchyma, so that this the extracellular spaces around the cells in the brain, and it binds to receptors on both the neurons and the glia in the brain, causing us to feel tired, and increasingly tired as the day goes on, as we make more of this adenosine. Now, one of the ways that caffeine actually works is it competes with adenosine. So um, it binds to those same adenosine receptors. So adenosine can't bind to it. So ultimately we feel more awake. 
Now, one of the things with caffeine is, is it has a half-life of about five to six hours. So that means after about five to six hours, you'll have about half as much of it in your bloodstream. But that still means that you're going to have a quarter as much 12 hours later. So really think about the timing of your coffee. You know, if you're having a lot of coffee and you're not sleeping well, the two things are quite possibly intimately related. So now we're going to talk about sleep cycles. So you might be familiar with the term REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep, which is kind of like the shallow stage of sleep. And we've also got deep sleep, which is also known as non-REM sleep. So basically our body cycles in and out of this shallow sleep, this REM sleep, in, down into deep sleep and back up again into REM sleep about every 90 minutes, so about every hour and a half. So the graph that we call where we map this dipping in and out of deep sleep is called a hypnogram. So here's one here. Um, and what we have on the axis here is time. Say that we've been sleeping for eight hours in a perfect world. Um, and on the axis here, we've got um, the different stages of sleep. So at the top, we've got being awake. We've got REM, so that more shallow stage of sleep, and we've got the deeper non-REM stages of sleep. So say a typical um, night, might, night might look a bit like this. So you start off awake, and then over the course of the first hour and a half, you go into this deep sleep, and after an hour and a half, you've gone back up into this REM stage. And that continues to cycle every hour and a half, uh, and then subsequent times, you won't go into as far as far into the deep sleep stage. So the subsequent dips into deep sleep become more shallow. And then after about, you know, eight hours, you probably wake up. So just to draw this line here, representing REM sleep. So we tend to be in REM sleep oh, four or five times over the course of the night. And in REM sleep is when we typically would be dreaming. So if you wake up during one of these REM stages, you're more likely to remember what your dreams were because they were literally just happening. But say if you were to wake up, your alarm went off right here in the middle of deep sleep, probably not gonna remember your dreams because you're probably not having any dreams. So as you can see, we, we, we continually dip in and out of this deep to shallow sleep and this through these different stages, um, a lot of different processes are happening. So for example, memory consolidation, waste removal in the brain, um, processing body movements, patterns that we've learned throughout the course of the day. So this staging is really important. Um, when we get older, this pattern becomes more and more irregular um, and we ha might have more difficulty sleeping. Um, over the course of the night, these periods of REM, it's, it's really light sleep, so you're more likely to be woken up. So you might actually have a wake period. You might be getting up then to pee, for example, um, or whatever it might be. You're more likely to hear the sounds of dogs barking or, or whatever it might be. Now, say you've been drinking, so this also influences the way we sleep. So we're less likely to go into these deeper stages of sleep and we're more likely to wake up and also they kind of stretch out a bit. So say it might look a little bit like this. So it'll be shallower. You might have a, several wakings throughout the course of the night. So you don't end up having that normal wave waveform pattern that you would if you were sleeping normally. That was a terrible waveform, by the way, sorry. <laughs> So you're probably wondering, how much sleep do you need? Well, basically, the older you are, the less you need. Um, so for example, children in primary school need about nine to 11 hours, um, teens about eight to 10 hours, um, and most of us our age will need about seven to nine hours. So anything less than that, and you're going to start compromising your body function and your memory. You might think that you're doing fine, but just imagine how well you would be working, how well your body would be working if you were getting all the sleep that your body needed. So for example, we know that if you only have five to six hours sleep, you have a 70% reduction in natural killer cells in your body. 
and natural killer cells are the type of white blood cell which are really important for fighting things like cancer. So not sleeping means your risk of breast cancer and prostate cancer and bowel cancer becomes increased. In fact, this is why the World Health Organization have called um, shift work a probable carcinogen because shift workers are less likely to get the right amount of sleep because it's disrupted. Uh, we also know that guys who don't have enough sleep um, will have make less testosterone, for example. So someone who only has five to six hours sleep will have make will basically have the testosterone levels of someone a decade older. We know that a night of no sleep basically is the equivalent of you know 0.1 blood alcohol level. So our body impairment is actually that high. We also know that um, only having four to five hours sleep puts us into this pre-diabetic state. So we make less insulin and the insulin that's there, well, our body becomes more um, resistant to the insulin that's there. Um, all this is reversible when you do restore your levels of sleep to normal levels. Um, so really the take home message is treat sleep like it's precious because really it is.